Thank you so much for the kind invitation to come and share God's word with you today. And I invite you to be in prayer with me that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable to God, our strength and our Redeemer. I, I am speaking today from the scripture of the common lectionary text from the Gospel, which is the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. And if you would like to follow along in the Pew Bibles, the English version, it is on page 878. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. In these words, we are invited into a very intimate setting of the final moments that Jesus spent alone with his disciples. If the words from John 15 had been placed in any of the other Gospels, it would have followed the Last Supper in the upper room. But there is no traditional Last Supper story recorded in John's Gospel. There's a foot washing service instead. And after the upper room foot washing experience, we find three separate discourses spoken by John to his disciples that are very similar in nature. In John 14, John 15, John 16. And it's supposed that these three separate stories are coming together to be grouped in the final compilation of John's Gospel. John 15 is the second of the three discourses that focuses on Relationship with God through Jesus, relationship with one another, and relationship with the world. So today I'm going to focus on the first of these relationships, our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. With these words, Jesus weaves us into the image of 
of a community of believers that are nourished by God, a community of believers that bears fruit. Now the grapevine, the simple grapevine, was the most prized of all ancient plants in Israel because it provided something to drink for a relatively low cost in manual labor in a land where rainy seasons alternated with the long, hot, dry summers where there would not be any rain. The vine produced nourishment and strength. And the vine image was as familiar symbolic image to the Jews in Jesus' day. The vine was an Old Testament symbol for the people of God, for Israel. And if you go back to Psalm chapter 80, verse 8, the verse talks about how God brought a vine out of Egypt and planted it in a place from which God drove out the other nations. That vine, of course, was Israel, brought from Egypt by Moses, who led the Hebrew people to the Promised Land, where the vine, where Israel, was planted. And yet, that vine that was planted in the Promised Land turned out to be less than healthy. It didn't thrive, and it didn't produce those luscious, juicy grapes. Isaiah, in chapter 5, tells us that the vine that was planted yielded wild grapes, little shriveled up grapes like raisins, instead of grapes that were bursting with color and flavor. Of course, Isaiah's pronouncement was that Israel was the vine that was turning out wild grapes, and the wild grape vine of Israel was not useful to God because it didn't produce good fruit. In the end, it was dismantled. And all of creation, all of time, held its breath waiting for a vine that would produce good fruit. And now, in Jesus' time, Jesus said, I am the true vine. I am the new covenant, the new law that replaces the old covenant. God is doing a new thing in me. And the first verses of John chapter 15 speaks of Jesus' connection to God. Jesus is the vine. God is the vine grower. And in his words, Jesus defines the disciples' connection point when he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. When you are connected to me, it brings glory to God. When you are connected to me, then God's love flows from me to you. When you are connected to me, then my joy is your joy, and it is a complete joy. Perhaps you've been to a vineyard before and have seen the, the woody vines or canes that are supported along fences. Amu has told me that she has seen vineyards in um, the Inchon State in Myanmar. In the wintertime, all you can see are the woody pieces of vine that are tied to the fence post. But in the spring, the vines begin growing, or the branches begin growing out of the vines, and the branches are what produces grapes. If a branch is not attached to the vine, the life-giving sap does not flow from the vine to the branch, and it cannot produce fruit, right? It's like a hand. A hand is not a hand unless it's attached by the arm to a living body. And the hand cannot do the work of a hand unless it's attached to the arm of a living body. In the same way, a vine branch is not a branch unless it is joined to the vine stock, and it cannot bear grapes unless it is joined to the vine stock. A branch that is not joined to the, to the vine is no longer a branch. It's just a piece of wood 
and is treated properly as a piece of wood. You toss it onto the fire and burn it to dispose of it. It's simply useless. In the same way, the disciple who brings fellowship with Jesus is useless. A Christian that does not produce fruit, that is not connected to the vine of Jesus, is not useful. Israel became useless to God when Israel did not bear fruit. But that didn't cause God to walk away and abandon everything that God had done. God did not turn his back on the world. In God's time, God introduced a new vine, and that vine was Jesus. And you and I are connected to that vine. We are branches of that vine because we abide in Jesus. The overwhelming focus of this passage is fruitfulness. The, where, the words bear fruit in English appear six times in these eight verses. Fruit bearing is not something that the branches do by force of will. The fruit happens organically because the vine is true and the gardener is good. But the branches of this passage do choose to abide in the vine. Abiding is important in the Gospel of John. Abide is a verb that, like bear fruit, it appears over and over again in this scripture. Abiding means is where the love of God has mutual indwelling. God in us and we in God. Now we are all just branches ourselves. We are not vines, and we're certainly not in charge of the vine. We don't even make ourselves fruitful. We bear fruit because we are extensions of the vine, pruned by the gardener. God, who wants us to be fruitful and to be drawn into the unity of the Father and Son, the gifts are God's love and presence and pruning that brings forth the fruit in us. Now there's an interesting thing about being a branch that's connected to a vine. All the branches are the same. Each branch is connected to the vine. There's no one branch that could sprout other branches or another vine. Every branch depends on the life that's given through the vine. So as Christians, we're all equal branches on the vine. I don't sprout a series of special vines that allows me to produce ten more times fruit than any other branch, and neither do you. I abide in Christ. You abide in Christ. God's love flows through the vine of my branch, and God's love flows through the vine to your branch. And as long as I'm a branch that's connected to the vine, I bear fruit. As long as you are a branch that's connected to the vine, you will bear fruit. So we need never feel inferior to another Christian. And not one of us should think that we are favored by God over someone else. You are a branch, you are a branch, you're a branch, you're a branch, you're a branch, I'm a branch. The vine is Jesus. Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. Now we can decide whether or not we will abide in Christ. We choose that abiding place of our soul. And if we want to bear Jesus' fruit, then we choose to abide in him, which means to abide in his love. The New International Version, instead of using the words abide in me, talks about remaining in me, or resting in me, dwelling in me. As individuals created by God, we have a choice whether we remain in Christ or disengage from Christ. Maybe it's sometimes difficult to remain in Christ. 
It doesn't happen automatically. It requires attention on our part. It requires spiritual disciplines on our part. It means finding the time and taking the time to nurture our relationship with Jesus. It means taking the time to pray, to be in conversation with God, to study the scriptures, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to others. We can ask God for help if it is difficult for us. In verse 7 of our scripture, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And in the context of this passage, if you feel that you don't have even the desire to abide in Christ or spend time with God, then ask God to give you that desire. Ask God to create such a spiritual hunger and thirst within you that you crave to read His Word and talk to God. I know from personal experience that God will honor your prayer. And there's additional help too. In the John 15 passage, a little bit later on, Jesus tells us that He will send us a Holy Helper, the Holy Spirit. I like to think of the Holy Spirit as those tendrils that hold the branch to the vine. So are the consequences of choosing to abide in Christ always easy? No, they're not. Are the consequences worth it? Yes. I once was shopping in a Christian secondhand bookstore and I found a book published in 1959. It's an old book, probably not in print anymore. It's called Great Women of the Christian Faith by Edith Dean. And as I looked at the table of contents of all these great women of faith, I noticed two names of Baptist women that I was familiar with, and one of them was Ann Judson, the first American woman missionary to the Far East. Ann was born in Massachusetts in 1789. Ann met Adoniram Judson when she was in her 20s. Adoniram was bound for the mission field to India. The young couple was married and soon they set sail to India. But then they were rejected in India and they were turned away. They spent several weary months of indecision before they decided to set up a mission in Rangoon, Burma. There, Anne's firstborn son died of jungle fever. Soon after, Anne became so weakened by a tropical illness that she had to sail home back to America, where she spent a year recovering before she turned around and sailed by ship back to Burma. During their first nine years, nine years in Burma, only 18 people had turned their life to Christ and invited Christ to be the Lord of their lives. War broke out between the English and the Burmese, and for the next two years, the Judsons experienced sufferings and dangers that have had few parallels in missionary history. Adoniram was thrown into a death prison, and Anne was under house arrest. She destroyed all the letters and the records of the Burma mission, lest they be used to convict her husband of being a spy. She hid his New Testament translation from English to Burmese in a pillow. She gave birth to a daughter, and the baby and Anne came down with smallpox. They recovered, and then Anne was stricken with a tropical disease almost always fatal to foreigners. She collapsed, and she lay ill for two months. With her husband being moved from prison to prison, Anne no longer knew where he was. She contracted spotted fever and during this time wrote in her journal, If I ever felt the value and efficacy of prayer I did at this time, I could not rise from my couch. 
I could make no efforts to secure my husband. I could only plead with that great and powerful being who has said, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will hear, and thou shalt glorify me. She wrote, God made me at this time feel so powerfully this promise that I became quite composed, feeling assured that my prayers would be answered. Well, after the war ended, the Judsons returned down river to Rangoon and went to Lower Burma to set up another mission there. Within a few months, Anne was stricken with a violent fever, and she died at the age of 37. Adoniram was away on a journey, and he did not even know of her death until several weeks later. Through hardship and through suffering, Anne and Adoniram Judson chose to remain in Christ, to be a branch connected to the vine. Their ministry produced fruit. Their ministry resulted in the translation of the Bible into Burmese. And as you know, that translation is still being used today. And some of you may have it right now with you. Before Adoniram's death, 24 years later, the Christian movement in Burma had produced much fruit. 63 churches at that time and a growing number of Burma pastors and assistants. Something good happens when we abide in the vine, when we abide in God through Jesus. It's not always easy, but it produces fruit. When we abide in Jesus like a branch on a vine, God's love is flowing into us in and in and in, and we fill with God's love. And God's love will overflow and pour out from us. Jesus' words beginning in the next verse after our reading, in verse 12, tells us how to, how to spend that overflowing love. When Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Such was the love of Adoniram and Ann Judson, whose love and life was poured out onto the peoples of Burma. Such is the love, such is the love of Jesus, whose love and life is poured out onto us each and every day. And such is the love that God is waiting to pour out through you and me upon a world that is so desperate for this kind of love. Let us stay connected to the vine. Let us be of the vine of Jesus Christ and produce fruit. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for being patient throughout eternity to bring a new vine into creation, the true vine of Jesus. God, thank you for the relationship, for the knowledge that we have of Jesus Christ. Give us the desire, give us the strength, the nourishment, as we connect to that vine, as we are the branches of that vine. God, you will produce fruit in us when we are connected to that vine. You will produce good works through us to build up that body of Christ. God, thank you for the ways that you serve the church and the world through those who are connected to the vine. We ask you to bless us this day. Amen.